This is Lisa from Mobile Tech Review, and this is the HTC1A9. Not to be confused with the M9, the M8, or any of the other M's that have come out before. This one is meant to be classy, yet more affordable than the HTC1 M series of Android smartphones. And as you can see, it bears more than a slight resemblance to a certain fruity phone. You know what I'm talking about there. And we can get into our discussions with this. HTC said that, well, we did the plastic antenna lines first, but it's the whole design, really. It's, it's the slimness of it. It's the speaker location. It's the way the glass curves. Let's get it out of the way. Okay. Might be slightly embarrassing, though, because you're... Your iPhone toting friends will say, hey, you joined us, didn't you? When you really didn't, you have the new HTC One A9, which is a mid-range phone, but these days mid-range phones are pretty darn powerful because not all of us need little cray supercomputers in our pockets. It has a much improved camera. HTC's sore point has been cameras for some time. This one is quite good and a host of other features. We're going to look at it now. So here it is, the HTC a9 this one right here i yeah i'm being facetious here but because it looks so much darn like the iphone 6s that we have right next to it obviously there's subtle differences round fingerprint scanner versus oblong fingerprint scanner hdc logo here no logo there both have their ear piece lids up top both have the speaker grill at the bottom both have aluminum designs with antenna lines going on there now the the hdc does something a little bit different here now they have the antenna window over here, the plastic cap up top, so that you have good reception despite all the metal here. It's also pretty as it is, very slippery material, more slippery than the iPhone 6S is, and I've had so many, whoops, almost drops at accidents with it, that if I own this phone, I certainly would put a case on it, and I'm not really one of those people who has to put a case on every phone that I own, but it's pretty, but it's slippery. Depending on where you buy it, whether it's unlocked or with a carrier, there's a couple of different color options available for this as well. Now we're looking at the unlocked model that HTC sells direct from their website, and that has a whole lot of LTE bands on it, CDMA and GSM, so it's compatible with AT&T, T-Mobile, and Verizon in the United States, though Verizon support's not coming till December. Probably Verizon has to add it to their network. I'm guessing what the deal is. And there's a separate Sprint model for those of you who have Sprint with a different selection of LTE bands on board. And for those of you who are using T-Mobile, we happen to have a T-Mobile SIM in this right now. Works fine, has band 12, and even supports Wi-Fi calling. Now, when HTC first showed this phone off, they said this is $399, but it turns out that was a price-limited promotion for pre-orders. It's actually going to be $499, or call it a $500 phone. And depending on your carrier, they may charge more. AT&T tends to mark up phones a bit. They're listing it for $520. Now, Sprint, who usually has a pretty reasonable price tag on their phones, though they're pushing a variety of lease plans and payment plans and stuff like that, they're listing the full retail at $696, which doesn't really make sense. I'm thinking, that, is that a mistake or something? It's actually more expensive than buying an iPhone or a Samsung Galaxy S6 on Sprint. Go figure. Hopefully that'll change. And T-Mobile doesn't have their pricing up yet. They'll probably be something around $500 is my guess. Now there's a lot of competition in that space for so-called mid-range phones. And like I said, these days mid-range mid phones are pretty powerful. They have ample RAM, decent CPUs inside, pretty nice cameras, and nice displays. And this one is indeed a nice display. This is an AMOLED display for those of you who like those AMOLED colors. It's vivid it has high contrast it's 1920 by 1080 resolution which is perfectly fine for a five inch display this is a fairly small phone and you can say that's one of the things that does set this apart from other unlocked phones in this price segment most of them are larger 5.5 inches and up except for the the nexus 5x that we recently reviewed which is a 5.2 inch phone and that one's 379 dollars Fits nicely in the hand. It has, I hate to say it, but the ergonomics of an iPhone, which means it's pretty comfortable. And there, even though the bezels are pretty narrow on the side, I haven't accidentally done things, which is one of the issues I have with a lot of Android phones that have very small bezels. Top and bottom, obviously pretty darn big bezels, and that's one of the things that does make it look like an iPhone, because most Android phones don't have so much space. USB HTC did this because they had their boom sound stereo speakers. And here we have the HTC One M9, so you can see right there. Nice big speakers on the grill. Sadly, those are gone from this, just the mono speaker firing from down here. It's an okay sounding speaker. It sounds pretty much like a lot of other mono smartphones. 
headphone jack there and HTC does really care about sound quality so they put a high quality amplifier and DAC in there so you're going to get some nice headphone audio which is pretty cool for a so-called mid-range phone if you can call it $500 mid-range. On the side here we have a textured power button which is good because again on the M9 they textured it very little and it was pretty hard to feel the difference between the power button and the volume up and volume down button so pretty distinctive now especially because this is a one-piece rocker instead of two discrete buttons and on this side we have two pop-out trays it comes with a little pokey tool to get them out the bottom one is for the nano sim the top one is for the micro SD card if you want to use one and with Android 6 Marshmallow this is the first non-Nexus phone to ship with Android 6 Marshmallow you actually get a new option for storage expansion where it acts like an extension of internal memory instead of like a removable media card so that's kind of neat too so yes this does run Marshmallow and HTC Sense software too but you know they, they still have a few things that are different the up and down scrolling all in all I've always enjoyed Sense and it keeps getting lighter and lighter and here in the settings, it has that kind of HTC look, but that's not a bad thing. It's pretty friendly. It's pretty understandable. It's not an overwhelming amount of settings here. Notice fingerprint scanner. There's support built into Android 6 Marshmallow, and the scanner is right here. And it works very well and very quickly, just about iPhone quick. And a little bit more reliable than the Samsung Galaxy S6, which sometimes fails to read my finger. This one almost never has a problem. So that one's been a good experience. And if you, if you turn on that, you're going to have to use a pin as well or some method of securing the phone. So just in case you don't have your finger in healthy condition available, you can use that as a backup. And every time you boot up the phone, you'll have notice it tells you, guess what? I've encrypted your storage for you. And you're going to have to type in your pin or your code to unlock it. HTC doctors that screen up a little bit. I think they think it making it explain what it's doing a little bit more perhaps. If we look at the display settings you can see we have glove mode here always welcome in colder climates right there and color profile. If you don't like AMOLED you can go with sRGB. Let's switch just so you can see what it looks like becomes less vivid so it's still pretty nice looking actually but looks more like a standard IPS LCD kind of thing it's a subtle difference but I think probably most people are going to stick with the AMOLED because it has those gee whiz nice colors now Samsung makes most of the AMOLED or Super AMOLED displays on the market of course they always get the latest generation so you're going to get a little bit more zing and pop and a little bit more sharpness and contrast of course this is also higher resolution in the Samsung Galaxy S6 Edge or the S6 obviously this is the Edge model size wise you can see they're pretty similar and even though the S6 has a slightly larger display the HTC one's a bit taller thanks to the design and compared to the HTC One M9, the, the more expensive higher-end phone, but that one's using a Super LCD, I'd say that the color is a lot more obviously vibrant on the AMOLED device right here. It's a pretty pleasing experience. All right, if this is a so-called mid-range phone, why is it called a mid-range phone? It runs on the Snapdragon 600 series. So those of you who are familiar with that know that the 400s are usually for the lower-end phones. The 600s are also for the middle mid-tier, not low-end phones, not super high-end phones, and the 800 series is in all the flagship phones. So this is in the 600 series. It's the Snapdragon 617, which is kind of an updated version. Well, the Snapdragon 615, no surprise there. It's an octa-core CPU, so it has four high-power cores, four low-power cores, 1.5 gigahertz for the high-power four cores inside. It has Adreno 405 graphics, so not, not as high, in, especially in terms of Adreno graphics, as any 800 series phone, but it's a decent enough phone in terms of performance, especially because the Android 6 is pretty quick and HTC Sense is a pretty light skin on top of it. And where you're really going to notice it is if you're doing something like playing really demanding games, like racing games, 3D games, that sort of thing. I don't mean if you're playing casual games that sort of thing. It's going to be absolutely fine. For the US model, we have 3 gigs of RAM and 32 gigs of internal storage. And depending on your country, you might actually see a version with 2 gigs of RAM and 16 gigs of storage. But that's what we're rolling with here. 3 gigs is pretty nice for, again, really, are we going to call it mid-range? It's better than mid-range phone. And 32 gigs of storage is pretty adequate since you have that micro SD card slot on the side. To expand it. Now the battery is obviously sealed inside. HTC has been doing unibody designs for a while here. 2150 milliamp battery. Today's big phones tend to have 3000 milliamps or maybe even more. 
this is not a physically very big phone. This is not a 5.5 or 5.7-ish phone either. So there's less room for it because HTC wanted to go with that flat, very iPhone-y design instead of the old curve that they had for years in their M series. See, there's more room for battery when you when you have that much of a curve on the back. Anyway, the fact that this has a 1080p display and not a QHD display, the fact that it's Snapdragon 600 rather than 800 means battery requirements are not as high either. So battery life is okay. I expect it actually, it might even be a little bit better than it is. With light to moderate use, it makes it through the day. And I mean, 8 a.m. to when you go to bed at night, so you put it on the charger at 10 or 11. If you use it moderately to heavily, I, I haven't found it making it through the day. So far, using GSAM battery monitor that measures actual screen on time per charge, I've been getting under four hours, which is not that good. Even the Galaxy S6, and that is not the Energizer Bunny among smartphones, was doing five, pretty much. And the really good phones managed six hours or so. So it's not fantastic on battery life. In terms of software, HTC is not customizing as much as they were. We still get the Zoe video editor, which is a pretty cool thing here. We have just the Google Play Music app. They're not doing their own separate music player anymore. They've got a little customizations going for the PIM applications, but other than that, it's pretty much straight Android, and that's fine. Performance on this is responsive enough. I mean, honestly, a Snapdragon 617 is enough for many folks. Like I said, unless you're really going to town, doing photo and video editing on this phone as if it was your only computer, playing 3D games, that sort of thing, then you'll, you'll say, well, it's not quite up to where I want it to be, but otherwise it's fine. Quadrant, it scored 26,574. On Tutu, 38,756. Now on the fastest phones, we'll see scores in the 50s, if not the low 60,000s for Tutu. So 38,756 is not bad at all, but it's not up there with the top phones. Geekbench 3, 733 single core, 3020 multi-core. And 3D Mark Ice Storm Unlimited, 9,260. Two. So you get about three quarters of the performance of a flagship phone, and that ain't so bad. It's better than half, certainly, that we see on some of the more affordable phones. The front camera on this is an ultra pixel camera, and that's a fine thing for the front camera because low light's often handy. You're not always taking selfies in the brightest location, you can shoot 1080p video. It's a decent solution for selfies. For the back camera, finally, HTC, we get to say some good things. Gone are those low megapixel, ultra pixel cameras that had all sorts of technical difficulties with a variety of shots and anything but low light where they generally did pretty good. Now we have a 13 megapixel camera with a Sony sensor. This is the same sensor we saw used in 2013 and 2014 flagships like the LG G3. And in fact, I would say it's somewhat comparable to that. And the software is better too, HTC software in terms of photographically speaking, not the user interface, has been a little bit wonky in terms of exposure, colors, and that sort of thing. And it's gotten a lot better too, though. I can see some odd green color cast going on right now as it's looking at a little bath toy there. Uh, but overall, it's not bad. The UI is pretty intuitive. Controls for flash and switching front and back cameras, photo versus video, your gallery access, and check this out. You've got a couple of different modes here, camera, panorama, slow motion video does hyperlapse video as well for inpatient people who want to see things happen faster than life. And Pro Mode, which tells you rich manual controls and so on. You raw shooters will like that. And this can output tweaked raw files. Now, keep in mind that raw files on camera phones really do show you just how not up to the standards of a digital SLR phone camera still are. It's going to be a lot of work often to bring up the quality on it, but it's not too bad at all. And Rather than show you on the teeny screen here, we're going to splice in some photo and video so you can see what these look like in a bigger picture. It's pretty nice. It's pretty pleasing. Honestly, I think a lot of people would be pretty happy with the camera in low light. I, it actually manages to capture some color in detail, but things like it will use the flash and in dark setting it should, but then it will absolutely white out anything that's white like our kitty's fur right here. So it's certainly not a flagship level camera, but that's fair because it's not a flagship price either. HTC One A9 with optical image stabilization. That means that 
This should be smooth when I pan, and it is. I'm going to see how it goes from sunshine to shade. Not too bad. 1080p is the max video recording quality available here. Now, before we get into a little gaming and let you hear how the speakers sound on this, a couple of other important things to talk about. Call quality on this is quite good. The earpiece volume I didn't find to be particularly loud on, but other than that, rich, full, natural sounding, definitely nice voice quality. Data speeds were par for the course on T-Mobile and AT&T's networks, the two networks we tested this on, and not unlike any other modern current smartphone that you could buy. So we got 4G LTE on board, all that good stuff, even if it is the unlock model we're testing, which is not offered directly by the carrier again, but sold by HTC, but there are carrier versions if you prefer actually getting, you know, in contract mode with your carrier or payment agreement, whatever it is. Anyway, let's try a little Asphalt 8, a pretty demanding 3D racing game, so you can see how it does when it's stressed a little bit. And we'll cut our volume at about 50% because it's a pretty noisy game. And that flash storage must not be the quickest, because that's taking a while to load. Come on, you can do it. Here we go. It's looking pretty nice, pretty smooth. Can't say that I feel like I'm losing any particular effects over here. And I am trying to play this sideways, so I will be being, playing this a little bit goofily. The frame rates aren't always super high, but it's not too, too bad, actually. Ha ha, take down. It's definitely playable. I mean, we're still talking a fairly powerful phone here. And the speaker is pretty quiet, too. And my finger is not over the speaker because the speaker is down right there, so I'm not blocking at all, it's just not that loud. Let's max it out for a minute. Wow, that's pretty loud. Average sounding in terms of quality, but pretty loud. And one other important thing to note, obviously we have, we have on-screen buttons over here rather than capacitive buttons surrounding the fingerprint scanner. Slightly confusingly, the fingerprint scanner, it doesn't move, it doesn't click, but if you tap it, it, it works as your home button as well. But it's not going to launch the new enhanced version of Google. Now you're going to press and hold on the, the on-screen home button if you want to actually bring that feature up. Hmm, go figure. So, you know, it's actually a very likable phone, especially if you're looking for something that is on the smaller side since, well, today's phones are getting to be awful darn huge. It's not bad looking. It is comically iPhone derivative, though, and that could be an issue for some of us. Uh, for the price, though, there's a lot of competition. I have to say the Moto X, most recent generation that we reviewed not too long ago, starts at $399, and that's a real nice phone for the money. So you could get that, and you could throw in some customizations, a wood back, a, more storage, all that sort of thing, and still come in for less than the HTC One A9. That kind of hurts. Then there's also, as I said, the Nexus 5X that starts at $379. And for those of you who really want flagshipy specs in an unlocked phone is going to have a bigger screen, which could be a plus for some of you. There is the Nexus 6P as well. So lots of phones vying for your love in this price range. Not an easy choice. So that's the HTC One A9. It will be available at the beginning of November, official launch date coming right up. And if you pre-order it, like I said, you get it for $100 less. That's going to end within two days of of this video recording though. So it's going to be a $500 unlocked phone or thereabouts on your carrier too in the United States. Though Sprint, like we said, is charging for some reason $696 full retail. I don't understand that. And I hear in the UK, the pricing is going to be higher too. Anyway, this has been the year of the pretty nice mid-range phone. So there's a lot of competition for HTC. Probably when they started designing this, they thought, hey, there aren't many of these. Let's do this. And now you've got the new Nexus 5X that we reviewed. You have the 6P. You've got the, the Moto X, the latest generation. Just really a sweet phone. There's a lot that competes with this. So, uh, 
primarily if you're looking for a small phone that's unlocked no carrier contract kind of thing you might be more tempted by this because it is smaller than a lot of those phones but other than that it's for five hundred dollars it's not the best you could do certainly not the worst you could do either but not a super duper great bargain i'm lisa from mobile tech review be sure to visit our website for the full written review and hit that like button and hit that